all right, well, I really debated what to do tonight, but I felt like God just continued just to press me forward and where we've been going. And uh, I know tonight we have quite a few young people here, so hopefully they're going to learn how to disciple their children. And I tell you what, this is going to be something I think that all of us, all of us can learn from. I see this is exactly how God disciples me. And so I've seen myself in these little graphs that I'm going to give you tonight. The last four weeks, we've been talking about just the way that God disciples us towards life. We talked about he gives us doctrine and then he instructs us in the way that we should go. He gives us vision. He says, without a vision, the people perish. God wants you to have a great vision of where he's leading you, right? And then he gives us an incredible example. He says, now that I've washed your feet, now go do and do likewise. He gives us constant encouragement through his Holy Spirit. He's constantly encouraging us and comforting us. He rewards us. Matter of fact, that's what you have to believe about him that you have to believe that he is a rewarder of those who diligently seek him. From the Greek, diligo, which means with love, that you lovingly pursue him and you seek him diligently, okay? He also warns us. You can imagine he would, if, if someone was going towards a cliff and you knew that they were going towards death and you didn't warn them, how could you love them? right? So God warns us. He also, if we're going the wrong way, he corrects us. He corrects us. And how important it is that we have a loving father and that we learn to correct our children with love and gentleness. Next, rebuke. And ultimately, we talked about chastisement, that there is a time where you bring physical pain if there is continual rebellion he says, there's the only thing that will, foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child, but the rod of correction will drive it far from them. So, I'm glad God is keeping us humble. Tonight, I want to just share with you, just kind of walk you through this little process. So, let's say someone is dealing with bitterness and you can see it in your family. I might set my child down. This is, I believe, what God tries to do to us. He tries to sit us down and teach us through his precious word. He says, listen, if you don't forgive others, I cannot forgive you. My grace is supposed to flow through you, not just to you. If you stop it up, then it doesn't continue to get to you. If a tree stops giving off oxygen, it's gonna stop pulling water from the ground and nutrients from the ground. It has to give in order to get. And it's the same way with us. God says, if my grace is gonna to get to you, it has to be able to get through you. So as I teach that to my children, say, listen, I know your emotions may be going crazy right now, but you need to talk to the Lord right now and say, God, give me the strength and the power through your Holy Spirit to overcome emotions that are trying to teach me how to think and try to harden my will and to walk in a way that is opposite of you. And so we teach our children with doctrine. Then we instruct them. Could go just like Jesus. He said, listen, he told stories. He said, there was a man who owed, in today's money, probably millions of dollars, could have never paid it back, went before the man that he owed it, and he said, you know what? You're going to have a good day today because I've had a change of heart. I'm going to release you from all of your debt, and you're going to go free. The guy's probably doing backflips, kissing people, hugging people he's never even seen before. And all of a sudden, he runs into a guy that he realizes, hey, you owe me 20 bucks. So what does he do? He calls the debtor, he calls the, the men that come and take them to debtor prison. And everybody's like, you got to be kidding me. You were just forgiven this great amount, and now you're not forgiving a guy who just owes you a few bucks? And so he's tr called in back to the man who had just forgiven him of the millions, and he says, is this, is this true, what I'm hearing? Well, you don't understand. This guy, he's owed this me for a long time. He wasn't planning on paying me and all this stuff. He says, ultimately what he did is he threw him in debtor's prison to be tortured until every last cent was paid. 
So God's saying, this is how it is in the kingdom of heaven. If you come to church and you think you're going to receive the grace of God and you walk out and someone gives you the stink eye and all of a sudden, you know, from there on, you have this uh, bitterness in your heart and you won't let God's grace get through you. Okay, so we're instructing our children. We give them a vision to say, listen, I was named after a man who was praying for the people that were stoning him. You know where he got that from? He got that power and ability through the agape love of Christ that came in him when the Spirit of God so purified him that he was sanctified out not to be loved by people he was here to love. You understand? That's why my mom named me Stephen because he was the first martyr who prayed for the very people who was killing him just like Jesus. And so I'm hopefully not going to stoop to becoming bitter when I have a vision and my mom had a vision and so does Christ have a vision for every one of us to walk in an unassailable way, to be able to walk that we refuse to get bitter, that God literally raises us up above that. So what would be an example of that? I've shared before where a guy for years, he did not, he did not pay me and ultimately God, somebody had given me a little, a little gift card and I took it down there right before vacation. And when I went down, his girlfriend came to the door and I talked to her and I said, hey, listen, I'm from this company and, and we've been doing work here for years. And I just want to say thank you for the work. And she said, oh, he hasn't paid you, has he? She said, he never pays anybody. I'm so sorry. <laughs> and come to find out that the homeowners association he was in said they had done research on him. He had, he had, went and done lawsuits against something like 20 different homeowners associations. He just moved in. He would get a home and then he would sue a bunch of people around him. He would not pay his bills. And then finally he would move out and go to the next place and go to the next place. But you know what happened? I took that, I took that gift card to him and said, well, he must need this more than I. And I gave it to her. When we got back from vacation, the man that she said never paid anyone, there was a check in my mailbox for the full amount (laughs) <laughs> and I said, thank you, God, because I think I heaped coals of fire on him because I doubt he had probably run into someone simply that was just saying, Lord, I know this man has done me very wrong and very dirty. And he's been leading me on for years, but you're bigger than all of that. You're bigger than all of that, right? So then we go to training. I remember with, you know, busing kids in for 25 years and I would try to teach these kids and train them. You know, someone did something to somebody else on the bus. I would say, all right, come over here. Tell them what you did. Ask for forgiveness. And man, that would be so hard for these kids. I can't do it. And I remember one time I said, listen, you pulled this girl's hair and you punched her in the face. Admit what you did. Confess it and say, listen, that was, that was very unkind. Please forgive me. I can't do it. She's, this person screaming, you know, this little kid. <clears throat> And I said, is this hard for you? Yes, I've never done this before. (laughs) Part of this is just getting one foot in front of the other, right? So we train our children, you know? So very, very early, I'll try to get the kids and say, listen, I'm having a nasty attitude right now. Just to own it, acknowledge it, right? Confess it and try to get God's perspective on it so they can actually agree with him. So then encouragement, So you say, listen, you're here to be love. You're here to be the love of Christ with skin on. So we have to, we have to toughen up and we have to realize that we're not here to be little pansies and be treated by the very people that are, they're so twisted. They're here trying to suck worth from you, but you have everything. If you have your identity and security in Christ, So you can walk as a representation of another realm in this planet right here. And people can see and realize, what did I just run into? Right? And they will be changed. They will at least see a whole other realm. So that's exactly what we're trying to hopefully get our kids to see. Right? How about like kids fighting? So what would be the doctrine? If my kids have heard this, they've heard this probably a few thousand times. Be kind one to another tenderhearted, forgiving one another, just as Christ has forgiven you. That's the doctrine, right? Well, he didn't, I understand. Was that kind? No. Okay. What does the scripture say? Be kind one to another, tenderhearted, forgiving one another. 
Are you going to forgive this person? Yes, okay, state clearly what you did. This is what I did, all right? Do you forgive them? Yes. And we get reconciliation, right? Reconciliation, extremely, extremely important. So, God says go beyond just forgiveness to pray for those who despitefully use you. Pray for them. So like when someone does you wrong, you're like, okay, got a bullseye on you. You just, boom, just put a bullseye on yourself. Now I'm going to start praying for you a little extra, right? Because now you have done something against me and I have legal ground in the spiritual realm to forgive you. And now you owe me in a sense in the spiritual realm. God's going to make it right. So what I'm going to start doing is going to praying for you. I'm going to start praying for you and doing you good. So I'm giving you special attention. Okay? So... Jesus, what is he doing? He's praying for those who are crucifying him. Tell your children, you know, of the guy who was stripped naked and he had, his wife had given him a gold necklace and he would move this thing around and as he's there in this concentration camp and one of the guards comes up and takes this gold necklace and snaps it off of his neck and this man is smiling. It's the only thing that he has to remind him of his wife that has been killed. And this guard is yelling at him and says, what are you smiling at? And he says, I'm thinking about the one thing that you can't take from me. And he says, what is that? Because it's not your life. He says, it's the ability that I have to choose how I'm going to treat you no matter how you treat me. You can't take that from me. You may snuff out this brief life, but you can't take from me the power that I have to allow the love of Christ to flow through me. No one can take that from you, okay? So, think about Jesus and Judas. This is crazy. But on the night he was betrayed, Jesus takes bread, which represents his body. He takes wine, right, which represents his blood, and he gives it to Judas. He washes Judas' feet, Judas goes to betray him, comes back, and Jesus calls him a name. I could think of some good names, but it's not the one that Jesus used. He says, friend. He calls Judas friend. (laughs) It's it's mind-blowing. It's absolutely mind-blowing. But that's what he does. So one person said, The true true test of Christianity is not if you just love Jesus, but if you can love Judas. Can you love those people that are the hardest in the world to love? That's what Jesus did. And that's what he wants to give us the power to do. So as we're teaching our kids, we can take it above just, okay, stop fighting, but give them a vision. Give them examples of greatness that they can say, God, will you give me the grace to achieve this kind where I'm betrayed and I love in spite of, that in spite of love. That's what I want to walk in. So we try to train our children in that. So as I've been, you know, teaching kids in Taekwondo for many years, what do we do? We explain something to them, right? We tell them about it. We explain it to them. And then we demonstrate it. So as we're trying to teach our children in the home, that's the same exact thing we want to do. We want to talk about the ways, the principles of God. We want to explain it to them. We want to pray over them. And we want to demonstrate it in front of them. Right? Extremely, extremely important. Then as you look on the outside here, this is so convicting to me. My wife does a stellar job over here on the left-hand side. If she, goes to, if she goes to get groceries at five o'clock in the morning, my kids are, you know, I have to say, uh-uh, there's no bickering over who gets to go with mom. So she has to, you know, dish it out who gets to go each week with, because they want to be with her, right? Relationship. How important is relationship with your children? It's incredibly, incredibly important. Then we've got prayer. Do you pray for your children? And then discipleship on the other side. I want you to think about these are all, 
things that can be multiplied together to give you, if we have a 10 on the left-hand side, a 10 on the right-hand side, and then we have a 10 in prayer, that would be a thousand points you could have. So those thousand points would equate to incredible influence in the lives of your children, right? But what happens if you say, oh, oh, actually, I don't pray for my kids. But I have a lot, we do all these fishing trips and we do this and we do skiing and we we have all this great relationship and I correct them after they've made mistakes. So I'm like, well, maybe I get a three in discipleship. Well, if you get a 10 in relationship and a three in discipleship, you get 30 points, right? Times zero. But if you can take, let me start praying over my children each day. Let me take it to a one. Let me take it to a two. If you can just say, God, help me to get the heartstring every single day of my child that I, can, that I can tie another heartstring to my child to build that relationship with my child, that I can disciple them early before they go astray, early up front, right? And then every day pray over our children. It's incredible. I could tell you incredible, incredible stories of people devoting themselves to praying, adding prayer to the equation for their children and what God did. Amazing, miraculous stories. So, as we're leading our children, we want to always think about, are we in the realm of leadership or are we in the realm of management? Are we managing our children or are we leading our children? If we're leading our children, right, they have vision. They know where we're going. They, they see the picture of what God is wanting to do. And that is fun. That is exciting. Managing can just wear you out, right? So I want to get to, Grant, if you just go back one, one slide. When we get down here to correction, all of the others are preemptive, right? Preventative and proactive that I hope that we are doing beforehand. When we get to correction, we're correcting them for a reason because now they've started off the path in some way. There's some violation of love and you want them to be able to see that. So now I'm gonna take you around. If we get to the point where you are correcting your children, how do we, I think from a biblical perspective, how do we correct our children in a way that is gonna be so redemptive that brings all of God's goals in our life to bear, okay? So as we go, the first thing is that it's all about their heart. It's not about just their behavior, right? If we get their behavior, we can do that through fear tactics. We can do that through manipulation. We can do that a lot of different ways, but that's not our goal. What is our goal? Our goal is the heart of our child, that our heart would be for God, their heart would be for the Lord, So as we do this, the first thing, if they've went off the path, we want them to recognize, recognize. Jeremiah says, at least recognize your sin. The people of God had gone off the path and they were just blowing every warning and everything else off. But he just said, okay, at the very least, let's just start at the very, very, very bottom. Can you at least recognize that you've gone astray? From recognition if you take it up a little level, that would be acknowledgement. He was wanting them to acknowledge, make mental assent, to say, yes, I understand that I've gone astray. Then you would try to get your children to admit it. Isaiah says, will you not admit them? We can deny our sin. We can blame shift. We can belittle our sin like it's no big deal. But we want our children to not only be able to admit when they go, they're going astray, but to do something that is a much higher level, and that is confession. What is confession? It is co-fessing. It is agreeing with God. It is saying the exact same thing, listen to this, about your sin. Not just that you sinned. Like I say, okay, so yeah, so I, I, I went out with a couple other girls. Oh, big deal. No, what is it from God's perspective that he opens my eyes and he reveals to me, and I agree what he says about my sin. That's confession. Are you guys all tracking with me? How important it is that we get our children to confess. He says, not if you admit, but if you confess your sin, then he is faithful and just to forgive your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. So, I remember seeing a 
a guy coming out of the courtroom at one point. And when he came out of the courtroom, somebody stuck a mic in his face and said, did you shoot that cop? And he said, yeah, I shot the cop and I would do it again. That's admitting, but that's not confessing. You understand? If it was confessing, it would be he would have his eyes open to God's perspective that he snuffed out someone's life that God had more, dreamed about more than the grains of sand on the seashore, right? And so he would have had a totally different perspective that would have led to something different. So the next one is if you get them to recognize their sin, the very next thing should be real godly sorrow. If their heart is for the Lord and they realize, oh, I just stepped off the path and I see it from God's perspective, they should go to real godly sorrow. If they don't go to real godly sorrow, we're gonna show you what to do. It is rebuke, right? Now, we just showed you from God's perspective what he says about this sin. In other words, let's just take it. I ask your, you ask your child to do something and instead of them obeying quickly, joyfully, they give you a rebellious spirit. All of a sudden, you go, I just don't want to obey. Well, let me show you what that's like from, from God's perspective. That's like mutiny on a ship. I'll we'll just be here like, I'm taking over the ship. Or I'm going up to heaven and I'm grabbing Jesus and I'm pulling him out of the throne and I'm going to take over heaven. He says, no. If you love him, you will obey him. That's the one thing that is the mark of love. If you love him, you will obey him. So you are not loving Christ if you are not surrendering to the God-given authority that he has given you, right? So as we show our kids and get them to recognize this, then hopefully they go real godly sorrow. If they don't, then we need to rebuke them. We need to say, hey, listen, um, level one would be to turn them back or keep down. Listen to two, it's to hack down or to beat down, to literally say, listen, I am, I am going to try to get you to recognize the importance of what I'm talking about right now through a rebuke. The Bible talks about a rebuke. Listen to this. A single rebuke does more for a person of understanding than a hundred lashes on the back of a fool. So if your child, you're trying to get them to recognize their sin and they're like, big deal. Then if you bring a rebuke and you have a wise child, what's that going to do? That's literally going to just revolutionize their world. So what I usually do is I'm talking to my children. I say, listen, right now I'm rebuking you. And if you're wise, God says this is going to have a monumental effect on you. Just a mere rebuke does more than a, if you're stubborn and foolish, literally you could, you could be beaten with a hundred lashes and it do nothing to you. But if you love God and you're realizing that he's correcting you right now, then this can have a life transforming power in your life. So next would be if the rebuke doesn't work, Eli rebuked his sons. His sons had gotten off the path. They were doing all kinds of crazy stuff. They did not have any regard for the Lord. They were in the temple of God, but they were just mocking the things of God. And he, re he rebukes them, but the rebuke was to foolish young guys. So it didn't do anything. It just rolled off them like water off a duck's back. So the prophet comes and says, you rebuked them, but you didn't restrain them. You didn't say, no, I understand that your love for God right now is not big enough to keep you from going the wrong way. So I'm going to restrain you. I'm going to keep you as you are in my home under my authority. I'm going to step up and I'm going to help you walk in a way that is righteous. Okay. So next is hopefully we go straight from recognizing your sin right to real godly sorrow. I remember years ago um, in the news, there was this football player that had beaten his girlfriend in an in a elevator. Some of you guys probably know who I'm talking about. but He was in a courtroom. It happened to be a woman judge. And she was up there, and the lawyer said, you know, hey, we've got you taken care of. They did this plea bargain or whatever. He was going to pay a few, you know, whatever, a few tens of thousands of dollars or something and do a little bit of community service, and he was going to be scot-free. 
And sure enough, she says, okay, we, we take the plea bargain, blah, blah, blah. And he reaches over and he smacks his lawyer on the backside, right in the middle of court. And she's like, did I just see what I just thought I saw? Because the whole courtroom just erupted in laughter. And she basically just took that piece of paper. She says, I, re- <laughs> I recall all of that. Your spirit right now shows me that you're not taking this serious. You have no remorse. This whole thing is a joke to you. And she threw him back in jail. (laughs) Just because of his attitude. God says that there's different types of sorrow. There's worldly sorrow. He says that leads to death. Godly sorrow, he says, leads to repentance. Repentance, right? So that's what we're looking for. I remember a preacher speaking one time and right while he was up preaching, a little boy just came running down the aisle and came up at the altar just kneeling and just convulsing. He was just weeping up at the altar and everybody's like, what in the world is going on with this kid, right? And so they're waiting for the pastor to get done. He finally gets done and the pastor goes down and says, son, what have you done? And the young man says, I disrespected my mother. And he's, I think he saw it. His eyes were open to, this is, this is disgusting. Why would I do that to the one who was literally instrumental in bringing me into this, this world? This is crazy. And he saw it, and that real godly sorrow came upon him where he never wanted to do that again. So if our children's hearts are for the Lord, we're going to go right from recognizing their sin, jumping rebuke, and restraining. We're not going to have to do that. They're instantly going to go to real godly sorrow. As soon as they get to real godly sorrow, what's going to happen? It's going to lead them to repentance. It's going to lead them to repentance. What is repentance? It's a change of mind. It's a change of heart. And it's a change of direction. Right? All three of those. They think differently about their sin. They choose differently and they feel differently about their sin. So they're going a totally different direction. William Booth said, one thing that he warned about in our day would be there would be forgiveness offered without repentance. That's facilitation of evil. Remember Jesus? He catches the woman in adultery and he says, neither do I condemn you, what? Go and sin no more. I'm not facilitating evil. I'm not here to condemn you. I'm here to save you. But I want you to change. I'm giving you the grace to change directions. So, John the Baptist's message, it says that he preached a baptism of repentance. And when many people came out to him, what did he say? He said, listen, bear fruit in keeping with repentance. So, As we go through here, we go, recognize. If our children recognize they're being unkind, and we say, do you realize that that's hurting God because he loves your little sister or your little brother? Yes. And they go instantly to real godly sorrow. They go to repentance. Then we lead them to renouncing. What is renouncing? It is with your mouth, literally, separating yourself from that behavior. This has totally basically been lost from the church, but I believe it is so instrumental in transformation. It is so incredibly powerful. If you ask your children, are you going to do this again by the grace of God? By the grace of God, I'm, not, I'm setting my will against this behavior. That's what renouncing is. Listen to what Nebuchadnezzar um, was told by Daniel. He said, therefore, your majesty, be pleased to accept my advice Here is a very, very, very wise man, okay? Ten times wiser than all the other people that have been reading in books their whole life. Daniel's tenfold, the wisdom. And he says, here's what he gives Nebuchadnezzar. He says, renounce your sins. Renounce them. Separate yourself from them by doing what is right and your wickedness by being kind to the oppressed. It may be that then your prosperity will come. Proverbs 28, 13 says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper, but the one who, listen to these steps, confesses and renounces them finds mercy. Not just, yeah, I did it, but I see it from God's perspective. I agree. I'm stating the same thing about my sin, and I am renouncing it. I am separating myself from it. So I remember my mom, I don't think she, maybe she didn't maybe understand what she was doing at that point, but she just asked me one time, she said, Stephen, are you ever going to do that again? 
And I said, maybe he will, maybe he won't. I don't know. (laughs) I wasn't ready to draw that line in the sand and say, no, by the grace of God, I'm going to lean on him to change my behavior, right, through the power of the Spirit. No, I didn't do that. I was just kind of like, I'm not for sure. But God wants us to come to that point. And as we're leading our children, we want to do that. We want to say, listen, that was disrespectful. If you honor me, God is going to bless you. It's the source of blessing in your life. Now, are you planning to do this again in the future? Are you going to trust the Lord to help you overcome this attitude? And if we get our children to say, yes, I'm renouncing that and I'm turning to the Lord. It's huge. So, next, we want to get them to receive God's grace. As soon as someone recognizes their sin and walks through real godly sorrow, guess what's going to happen? Satan's going to be there to try to take them into condemnation instead of conviction. Look at the difference between Peter and Judas. They both fail Christ miserably. It says they both went and wept bitterly. And then... They both start the process of repentance. Judas goes and takes this filthy money and takes it back to the temple and says, I don't want this. He's changing his ways. He's changing the way that he feels and thinks about his sin and the way he's choosing. That's the beginning of repentance. But you know what full repentance is? It's turning from your sin, turning to your Savior. If you just turn from your sin, that's behavior modification. That doesn't save you. Saviour is, is turning from your sin and turning to Jesus and trusting him. But he couldn't, he couldn't believe enough into Christ that if I literally betrayed him, that he could ever forgive me. But what does Peter do? He turns from his sin and he turns back to Christ. He turns back to Christ and he rocks the world. He rocks the world. So this receiving says it is by grace through faith, not of works, lest any man should boast. So if we realize, yes, you messed up here, let's confess it, let's renounce it, and let's receive God's grace and mercy for it. You guys tracking with me? So now, you may need to, let's say a child is being dominated by this thing right here. As Most men are in our culture. And they can't control this thing. So we could say, hey, listen, can you, we got to put filters on or do this or do that or whatever. I don't know. Maybe some time restraints if they're wasting their time and all these different kinds of things. But many times it's literally, you know, the prayer, lead us not into temptation. We give an eight-year-old a phone that they're two taps away from the most perverse things in the entire world, and we expect them to handle it. We need to remove, I believe, many times the temptation until we come to a point of strength in the Holy Spirit. I think it's wrong. So I'll tell you what we do with our kids. If my kids go and I say, hey, I want you to hang out with whoever, whenever, wherever, But if you come home and I sense a difference in your spirit, you're prideful instead of humble. If you're rebellious or whatever, then we're going to reel it back in because you're not ready for that relationship. I want you to be able to go anywhere and spend time with everybody. But I want you to keep your eyes on Jesus and I want you to lead and not follow in the wrong direction. So we have to, with the Lord's guidance, right, may have to remove certain things at that time. The Bible says if your hand offends you, what do you do? Cut it off. Be serious. So, next is replace. Replace. The replacement principle is if you remove, if you remove the things that are overwhelming for your children, they just can't control them at this stage in their life. God did that for me. When I was driving in my vehicle, I was listening to filthy music, and I was weak because I had given it to him multiple times. And it's pouring rain. I'm driving down the road just thumping to this music. And I'm crying. I said, God, please save me. (laughs) And God said, sure. A lightning bolt, I'm telling you what, came down. I don't know if it hit my truck, but that brand new stereo that I just got, just that's all I had. 
And I just said, thank you. <laughs> so from there, my CD player worked. I don't know if it was God, but I think he certainly allowed it. And now I, I have the strength. I don't even have the desire for that type of music. But at the time, it was so overwhelming to me, I couldn't overcome it. And I believe God just helped me in that stage. And he replaced it with godly things that drew my heart to him. And that's what we need to do with our children. Next is reconcile. Reconcile. So if, if our children have done wrong, or if we've done wrong, what do we do? We want to reconcile with who? With God. We want to reconcile with those we have injured. So in our home, we just simply go, listen, you did this to so-and-so. Ask them to forgive you. I'm sorry for punching you. Please forgive me. That was unkind. Okay, do you forgive him? Yes, please, I forgive you. Okay, did anybody else see you? Yes, so and so and so and so. All right, bring them in here. Okay, ask, ask them to forgive you for your bad example, right? Will you forgive me for being a bad example? Yeah, now you're being a great example. Thank you. All right, so we reconcile. Let's pray and ask God to forgive us. We reconcile with God. We reconcile with who we hurt and we reconcile with those who we were a negative influence on. Now, what have we done? We have made things right. Next, I'm gonna give you three more. Listen carefully is restitution. That word is not a big one in the church as well. But listen to this, restitution. This is Numbers 5, 7, and 8. It says, if one wrongs another in any way, he must confess his sin he committed, must make full restitution, add to it, and repay the person he wronged. So he's saying, listen, if you did something, let's say I stole my neighbor's bike, I stole my neighbor's bike, and I'm like, hey, sorry, dude. Okay, God's forgiven me. He says, wait, wait, wait. If you truly see, my, see it from my perspective, you walk through real godly sorrow, you're going to say, Lord, please give me the grace. Never do that again. I'm telling you, you can trust me. I'm never going to do that again by the grace of God. I've changed the way that I think, feel, and choose. I've given my life to Christ, and I'm a new creation. He's going to empower me to live a totally different life, Right? So here's what I want to do. I want to do what I call glorified time travel. We can go in the present right now and we can travel back into the past and say, either now in the present or in the future, I'm going to go back and I'm going to try to make up for what I did against you. You guys tracking with me? What happened when Jesus walks under Zacchaeus' tree and he says, hey, I'm coming to your house today. And they go to Zacchaeus' house, and Zacchaeus, basically, he just confesses. He says, man, if this guy knows my name, and I've never even seen him before, he knows what I've been doing. He knows all the stuff. I've been living greedy. I need to live generously. So he says, Lord, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to take half of my money right off the top and give it to the poor. I'm living generously. Then anyone I have wronged, I'm going to repay fourfold. Because they could have taken that money and have been investing that money and making money on their money. So I'm going to go and I'm going to, if I've, if I've stolen $1,000, I'm going to repay them $4,000. The Bible doesn't tell us everything that happened, but can you imagine Zacchaeus showing up at all these people that he has wronged and said, listen, man, they're hiding in the living room. Get down, it's Zacchaeus, right? And he says, I see you in there. All right, come on out here. And they come up, great, now what does he want, right? And he says, hey, I took an extra $1,000 from you last year. Will you please forgive me? I had this guy come to my house. I'm completely different. Here's $4,000. What? Who came to your house? <laughs> Who came to your house? Because you're not the same man. Because they see that he has so hates his sin that he's willing to, in the future, even at great cost to him, to go back and try to make those things right. Not to pay for his sin, but because they harmed other people in the past that we want to go and try to make it right if there's any way possible. Are you with me? So we can say, listen, if we can lead our children to make restitution if they've hurt someone in any way, it's not always possible, but when it is possible, we need to teach them that principle. You need to go back and try to make it right if you can. Next is resolve. So renouncing is setting your will against your sin, right? publicly announce it. I'm telling you, if you just add this to when you're talking to your children, ask the Lord to set your will against your sin. What is resolving? It's setting your will for righteousness. 
Now, the key is not that I depend on my own will, like I'm white knuckling it. That's not the key at all. But God does give you a faculty, and Joshua says, choose you this day whom you will serve. I love what Pastor Gary says. He says, it is a grace-empowered will. He does not believe in a free will, and I don't believe in it either. Because it says at one point that Satan has taken them captive to do his will. I believe they had a free will in the garden. They could choose. But you know what they did? They chose wrong. Then Satan took them captive. He brought them into deception. So they weren't even free to choose until God's grace comes and illuminates the lies, right? And says, I will give you the power. I will work in you both to will and to do my good pleasure. That is a grace-empowered will. So we say, listen, God will give you that power to make the right choice and go the right direction if you will set your will. I've shared this before, but this is an awesome story. I don't try to draw a lot of theology out of near-death experiences, but I believe that this is as scriptural as the day is long, and that is this man has medical proof that he was dead like 45 minutes, and he says while he was, while he was dead that an angel was escorting him up through the first heaven and into the second heaven, through the second heaven, up towards third heaven, right? And as he's going up, he says he sees these demonic creatures that are so disgusting that he's having a gag reflex. And then he sees these other just beautiful beings all around that he says he's tempted to kneel down and worship them. And he looks back to earth and he sees some people that are just being molested by the enemy. And he sees other he sees other people that are being protected by angels. And he says, what is the deal? Why are some being molested by the enemy and others being protected by angels? And the angel tells him this. He says, those that are being protected by angels are those who have set their will to resist the enemy. And the moment they do that, all of heaven comes to their rescue. And man, I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here listening to this guy. And I'm thinking, that's exactly what the scripture says. What, resist the devil and what? He will flee. Why does he flee? Because you're like, you're running from him and all of a sudden you don't know, I'm going to turn. And the, the angels, these 10 foot angels are going, oh no, Steve turned around. No, the moment I set my will, God says, now look, he's chosen. He can't do it on his own, so, but he's chosen. He set his will. So now I'm going to come and empower him and I'm going to rebuke the devourer for his cause. That's powerful. We have to learn to set our will. And we have to teach our children, set your will for righteousness told people, the men over transformed and really every time that before the people, the men of Israel could go into the promised land, they had to read different blessings and 11 curses and call them down on themselves if they ever went back to Egypt and went back away from the things of God. That's a level of resolving that's mind-blowing, is it not? But they're saying, listen, I'm setting my will to follow the Lord setting my will. Job did it. He said, I have resolved that my heart will not sin. Have you set your will for the Lord and righteousness? Or are you like, well, I'm like a chameleon. I can fit in with anybody. If they're cursing, I curse. If they're not, I don't. And, or have you said, this is where I'm going. By the grace of God, I'm choosing to lock my will around his kingdom for his glory. And God will come and help you do it. All right? The last one is rest. The Bible says, in repentance and rest is your salvation. To rest with a thankful heart. It says, God finds great joy in those who hope in his mercy. So I hope this makes sense. The, first, the second two, the rebuke and restrain, those two are not all the time. Okay? If it goes right and I say, hey, what does God say about being unkind? He says, be kind one to another. Okay. Was that kind? No. They recognize it. They go instantly to real godly sorrow. You see the tears starting to stream. What happens? They repent. They say, Daddy, I don't ever want to do that again. Okay, well, you've already renounced it, right? That you've set your will against that. So we've repented. We've renounced. Are you received? You understand that? You say, God says, if you confess your sin, he's forgiven you. Has God forgiven you? Just ask him. Say, God, please forgive me. Okay. If you just confessed it and you turned to him, he's forgiven you. You're reconciled with him. He's never going to remind you of it. We're not going to hold it over your head again and say, oh, remember what you did yesterday? No, he cast it as far as the east is from the west. And so now we've received God's grace. We reconcile with those we've offended. All this can happen in like 20 seconds, right? Reconcile, make restitution. Do you need to give the toy back? Whatever, let's, let's fix the problem, right? 
remove, these, these are the two also that don't always apply, but sometimes they apply, that we need to remove something that is just overwhelming our child, and they cannot overcome it at the stage of maturity they're at. And then we need to replace it, okay? Then lead them to resolve, to set their will, and to rest in God's grace to be all that he's calling them to be. So I'm telling you, it looks like a lot in the beginning, but I'm going to give you guys tonight, anybody that would like one, if I have enough, a magnet. I know a lot of you guys have these. But I, t- I promise you, if you will take this right here, and you'll see that four of them are in different colors. And you just take it and say, okay, what just happened? I'm correcting my child. Why am I correcting my child? Because obviously there was a violation of love. And so you just hold this out and say, do you recognize why daddy's talking to you right now? Yes. Is it right to steal this person's whatever or whatever you're dealing with? No. You give them God's perspective on it. Hopefully they will go right to real godly godly sorrow and you'll see that their heart is hurting because they hurt him and they hurt someone that he loved. They instantly go to repentance. They go to renouncing their sin, right? They go to receiving God's grace for it. And you just walk them around the circle. Let me tell you something. You don't have to do this 50 times about the same thing. You know what will happen? Pretty soon they will understand this in a moment. Literally, they say, God, please forgive me. Let me go make it right with this person. Let me make it right with anyone I affected, right, with my sin. And God, I'm setting my will against it. I'm receiving your grace for it. And I'm resolving to walk by your grace above this. And I'm resting in your power to help me do it. And God's going to lead us in powerful, powerful ways to raise up incredible godly champions. All right? This is not just for your children. This is for all of us. If you realized I'm walking in a way that's displeased, that's displeased God, just take it out and say, God, I see that you're showing me my sin. Please forgive me. Walk through that real godly sorrow. Walk through that repentance. Change your mind. Renounce it. So many times God has said, Steve, you're not practicing what you're preaching right here. Why don't you state with your mouth? You know how I got married? It wasn't all the warm, fuzzy feelings that I had and all the commitment that I had inside and all this kind of stuff. All that stuff was great. I said a few words with my mouth. I said, I do. Boom! My whole world changed. Right? It was just a couple of words. That's all it was. And you say, and say, hey, listen, by the grace of God, are you going to do this again? I want you to set your will and then rest in God's power to walk in a way that pleases him. There's power in your words. Okay? So let's bow our head. Father God, I pray right now, Lord, that you will give us the grace to lovingly disciple our children into a, such an intimate relationship with you. And Lord, when we stumble and we get off the path, you have showed us so clearly how you just lovingly correct us and draw us back. And you're able to pay for the consequences of our sin, Lord, and never hold it over our heads again. Restore us, restore that beautiful relationship and raise us up to be examples, Lord, of all that your grace can empower us to be in this day. So Lord, I ask that you would give us great wisdom as we disciple our children, Lord. Help us to first illustrate this, Lord, that we would be willing to recognize our own sin when we stumble and we get short with our children or we are angry or whatever the case may be, Lord, that we would walk around these principles that you have given us and just say, Lord, I I want to state with my mouth that I'm setting my will against the evil and I'm setting my will for you and I'm trusting you to empower me to walk above all known sin out of love. So Lord, I just pray for that power. I pray for that strength. I pray for that wisdom and grace on our lives. I pray for blessing on every single person, every family here, Lord. Unite their hearts, bless them, and cause them to be a great blessing to others this year. We pray all this in your matchless, glorious name. Amen.